two o'clock. Okay, we are recording now. So today we will keep talking about uh, rot. Um, we will have uh, another example of uh, we manually build a rot chain on libc and uh, instead of getting a shell we are going to uh, open and uh, read a secret file and um, so the reason we're doing this is uh, uh, in dynamically linked library uh, uh, executables uh, there are not so many gadgets however they are usually uh, linked with the uh, dynamically linked with the c standard library uh, which is big uh, and uh, we can, uh, even for dynamic link executable, we can still build a drop chain uh, on the uh, libc part uh, because libc is code, so we can execute code there. And we will also talk about uh, some tricks here and there along the way. And also after that, we will talk about a technique called blind drop. And we will briefly talk about it. I never uh, tried it myself. Uh, it's a very powerful uh, attack, uh, pop, uh, paper published in 2014, I remember. Uh, the lead author actually uh, died for a motorcycle accident or something. Um, but the paper is a, it's a great read, a very detailed. Uh, also, we're talking about some uh, defensive ideas regarding how, to, how can we defeat uh, rot. Okay, let's get started. Uh, so first, um, we will take a look at the homework. So in the homework, you use the Rob gadget, the tool to generate a Rob share code, which give you a shell. And um, uh, in the homework, I ask you guys to uh, explain the code but the, the Python exploit the script line by line. And here we're going to take a look at this, uh, how this is working. Uh, we actually talked about the last part, which is add RAX1 return. So there are 59 of those. The purpose of this is to make RAX of uh, 59, which is the system call uh, number or execute a new process. Uh, we didn't really go over the, the, like the 20 statements before that. So we'll take a look at that. Um, as we can see here, the very first uh, statement where gave an address, which is a gadget, is pop RSI return. So this address is supposed to overwrite the save the return address on stack. Well, uh, yeah, save the return address on stack. Um, so when the function returns, instead of a return to the calling function, it will return to this gadget. And what this gadget does is to pop RSI and return. So there are two instructions here and both instructions were influence the stack. Both instruction will make the stack go uh, up for uh, eight bytes. So each instruction will increment the in stack for eight bytes. So when we execute, when we actually execute this one, uh, this the code, the RSP will points here, which basically points to the next uh, item on the stack and it will execute pop RSI. So after executing pop RSI, the address of data will go to RSI and the RSP will go uh, increase four bytes and points to the, the address of next gadget. That is where, that is when we execute return. So we go to the next gadget. And the next gadget will also have two instructions, pop RAX and return. And this time uh, when we pop RAX, uh, we are not really popping the address of the string being sh into rax. We are directly popping those eight characters slash bin slash slash sh into uh, 
RFA, uh, RAX, directly, not the address. So after that, there is another, another gadget is uh, uh, move RAX to the memory pointed by RSI. And RSI is where we set. So we're going to move this string to a memory location. So there will be two copies of the string. After this, uh, this line, there will be two copies of the string in the memory. One copy is on the stack. Uh, another copy is in the dot data section. So uh, getting the dot, the dot data section is not a very uh, difficult task, uh, especially if we disable address space name of the randomization here. Uh, the reason we find uh, the dot data section is we want to put some data there. And uh, we so we need a memory location or memory uh, region that is writable. And obviously dot data is writable. But obviously when we do this, we don't really care what global variables are already in the dot data section. We may overwrite something there, but it doesn't matter. We don't care about that. So after that, we pop RSI again, uh, maybe put a lot of data somewhere. There is a lot of data plus eight. So, so uh, the difference between this Rob share code and uh, the one I showed you guys in the uh, class, the one we manually crafted, is uh, uh, the one we manually crafted, we were trying to find the string being sh in the uh, memory space and find its address, right? But this one, you don't need to find any address of uh, those strings. They directly embedded those strings in the share code itself and at a runtime find out the, uh, technically here it's not really at runtime find out the address. Uh, we, we still know the address uh, beforehand in this case. Uh, so later we're going to manually craft a complicated uh, Rob share code, uh, which we try to read some uh, uh, secret. Uh, before that, uh, let me go through some useful gadgets. Uh, in the homework, I noticed that uh, actually in the class, I showed you guys the NOP, the NOP, then the return gadget, right? So I noticed that in the homework, um, many of you already submitted. Uh, when you look for the NOP gadget, you are searching for NOP return, which is actually not necessary, right? Because the NOP instruction does nothing. So here a NOP gadget is just a return. If you search NOP return, you may not get anything. Well, we were lucky uh, in the last time, there was one. But in most cases, you may not find a NOP return, right? However, a NOP, a NOP gadget is just a return. And you can find so many of those because at the each, at, uh, end of each function, there is guaranteed to have a return, right? And that is a NOP. So, so NOP return is basically the same as a return. Um, there are some gadgets can help you uh, set up the, uh, uh, yeah, I can skip this one, yeah. So there are gadgets that can help us uh, put values into registers and also at the same time, skip data uh, on the stack. Uh, why do we want to skip data sometimes? For example, in this case, this is data. This is not an address. You can say everything here we put, uh, this one technically is also a data. So it, all other things we put here is actually a code pointer uh, or a gadget pointer. Anyway, it's, a, a it's an address of some kind of code we're going to jump to. So in the Rob share code, the most important thing obviously is that those address, the address of those uh, gadgets. And there could also be some data like the string of being SH itself, the, the address of the data. But you, we cannot treat those data, those items, as address. Otherwise, the program, our share code will crash. That's why we have to skip those, right? Uh, and the pop is the instruction uh, we can skip. Of course, if you can find other gadgets. If something you know, there is something you want to skip, you can find a gadget like uh, add something to uh, ISP. You can also skip that. Uh, so those instructions, these instructions can help you 
uh, store values into registers. And sometimes you don't really care about the storing values to, for example, to R12. You don't really care. And maybe, maybe the, the only purpose of this is to uh, skip data on stack. And also, uh, like I just mentioned, the log could just be return or not return or something uh, else, uh, like uh, addition to something then return. Something doesn't really uh, change your uh, share code behavior. Um, another interesting thing is um, the system core instruction is uh, very rare in uh, normal programs. Uh, you can imagine that if you develop a C program, uh, most likely you are not going to use the system call instructions. Your program were not going to make system calls directly. Your programs will use a C library uh, to do all kinds of things, like uh, open a file, read a file, something like that. And the C library will actually uh, make the system call. So sometimes, uh, maybe find the gadget in C library is uh, a little bit difficult. For example, uh, if uh, the ASS, uh, ASLR is enabled, uh, the, you don't, it's, uh, it's a little bit tricky to find out uh, where is the C library loaded. However, the program itself, the executable itself uh, could be uh, uh, not compiled with uh, precision independent uh, execution or precision independent code. So that part may not be randomized. Uh, it's easy to attack that part, but you don't have all uh, the system call instructions. So in those cases, uh, we can also call uh, library functions instead, instead of uh, making system calls directly. And also, even if there are system call instructions in your battery, right? What if there's a system call, but there's no return? Just a system call instruction, not a system call return. Then it's not really a gadget. Right, it's just a system call. It's not a gadget. For gadget, you need a system call return. Uh, so after the system call, you can go back to your control. Otherwise, for example, if you want to make multiple system calls, if you only want to make one system call, it doesn't really matter. But if, uh, let's say, uh, the, the example I'm going to show you today, we're going to open a file, then read the file, then output the file data to standard out, right? So that's at least two system calls. If you do open, read, write, those three system calls, that's three system calls. There is another one, it's a open, send file. There's a system call called send file. Uh, so if you do open, send file, you only need two system calls to do that. But still, um, you cannot directly make system calls because you don't have a gadget like system call return. So instead, we're going to call C libraries to do that. Um, and uh, there is a lot of the very interesting um, and useful gadget. Uh, it's called uh, the uh, stack uh, pivot. How, how do you pronounce this word? Pivot, pivot. Um, so the idea is um, we're going to put things onto the stack, our raw share code onto the stack. And we are hoping uh, the program counter, the uh, RIP, uh, look for not look for addresses to execute code on our stack, right? But what if there are some constraints? We can, let's say we can only write 10 bytes, uh, overflow 10 bytes on the stack. Okay, or 10, byte, 10 bytes is too small in 64. Let's say 50 bytes. We can only overwrite 50 bytes on the stack. So we can only put like uh, uh, six uh, gadgets address there at the most. Well, you may also need to put, put some data there. So uh, maybe even four or five gadgets here. So it's not really enough for you to build something, to put something useful, right? So then in those cases, uh, there is a very interesting gadget people find out is there are instructions like exchange RAX RSP return. So by using this gadget, you can change the value of RSP. You can, so the RSP were pointed to another memory location, which you can control by using RAX. 
then at a totally different place, you can put your rope gadget. And uh, you may not have the constraint of uh, overflow 10 bytes there. So it's like the first stage, you probably can only overflow 50 bytes. And from there, you find a, find a gadget to make your stack pointer to point it to another place. And in the other place, then you can have a lot of uh, gadgets. Uh, there is no limitation of the size anymore, right? So there are a lot of uh, crazy and uh, creative things you can do uh, with um, uh, with gadgets. Uh, you probably never see this kind of instructions in real world uh, binaries. I've never seen something like this. Never seen something new. But this is a valid instruction. Usually, compilers don't generate this, but but uh, somehow. Sometimes maybe just some random data you can find gadgets like this surprise you. Okay, so today what we are going to do is we are going to uh, develop uh, a Rob share code to read a local file called the secret, uh, and we are going to use the the binary we used last week, which is return to lib say sixty four bit. So you actually have this binary. Uh, we're not using the static version. We are using the dynamic version. Uh, so uh, you can, uh, we can, we can do this together. Uh, you can, you have this binary. You have the raw gadget. So we can do this together. So what we are going to do is, we are going to make two system calls here um, instead of uh, making. I'm sorry. We're, we are going to make two library calls here instead of uh, making two system calls. Uh, the first library call is uh, is this uh, open. Uh, by the way, they correspond to system calls as well. Uh, there is an open system call. There is a, a, a send file system call. But we're not doing system call directly. We're doing uh, function calls. Um, to to use this one. So those two, uh, the, the open, you are probably familiar with this. So the open function call and system call take the file name, the file path as the first argument. Uh, the second one is actually uh, the, the flag. If you want to, I think this is flag. You want to uh, read it or you want to read write or you want to append something there. Uh, that's the one. So. Uh, and uh, this is 64B version. So the first argument you put in RDI, the second argument you put in RSI. Okay. Then uh, after this function returns, the return value will be in uh, RAX, right? And RAX, uh, the value of RAX is the file descriptor uh, which opens this. Uh, we are going to cheat a little bit here today. Um, well, you, you can imagine what you are supposed to do if you want to have a very generic share code. What you are supposed to do is the return value of open will be in RAX. And it's supposed to, uh, is this will be the second argument for send file, which means you need to put the value of RAX into RSI. And I will show you that uh, it's really hard to find a gadget to do that directly. Okay, uh, there are some tricks you can use. You probably want to, there are many things you can do, right? You, you check what gadgets are available to you. You think, how can I chain them together to eventually move something in RAX to RDI? Uh, for example, you can push this RAX into stack, then pop it to RSI, uh, or you can, uh, if there is no gadget to push RAX to stack, then you think, how about uh, move, maybe there is a gadget to move RX to some memory location, and uh, that memory location is uh, indexed by another register. Then you can put that register point to the dot data section, then put there, then find another gadget to read things. Uh, anyway, uh, it's not very, it's not very easy, but doable. Okay, we're going to cheat a little bit here today. Uh, instead of uh, uh, moving RAX. The value of Rx to Rsi, we will just directly use the FD4 here, okay? Because uh, the program we are using, it only has uh, three fire 
this curve just open. Uh, one, two, three, right? Uh, STD in, STD out, STD error, right? So the next one to be open is guaranteed to be four. So we just, we're going to cheat a little bit. We're not going to, we're directly putting four into RSI in this case. We're not going to put RSA into RSI. Then our DI is also simple, just the one. Our DX is simple, zero, our CX is simple, uh, 1,000. It doesn't have to be that big. This is a size of data you want to read from the file and send to the first uh, argument. So basically the first argument is um, the file descriptor you want to send off things, STD out. Uh, STD in is zero, right? Uh, then the second one is the file descriptor you want to uh, read data from uh, RDX. This this one I don't I don't remember. It's let's just uh, search it. Out. Oh yeah. So the first. Uh, Argument is a file descriptor you want to send out the data. The second is a file descriptor you want to read the data. Then the third one is the offset. So basically, we just want to read from the beginning to zero. So how many bytes we want to write to read? Uh, we can. Uh, the secret file we're going to use is very small anyway, so we don't really need uh, one solid. Uh, we can read uh, just a several bytes, uh, which means that. Sometimes we don't even, maybe if we're lucky, uh, we don't even need to set RCX. Maybe the RCX already has some positive value, so we don't need to set it. So we don't need to find a gadget for that. Also, this is a trick in shared coding. Uh, sometimes, uh, at least in this course, when we try to do things, we try to set all the registers to the value we want. But uh, in uh, real world scenarios, some of the registers may already have the value we want. Uh, then in those cases, uh, save you several instructions uh, for Rob, save you several gadgets, because some gadgets are very difficult to find anyway. Right? Then let's start with, where is it? Okay, so here we have a secret file recorded, secret, uh, which has uh, uh, just a hello world, nothing else. Uh, then the thing we are going to attack is uh, the this one. Okay. What we are going to do is we are going to build a Rob chain uh, to to achieve this, which is equivalent to this. Open this and send the file. Uh, let me let me open a, maybe just a browser to give us some. Oopsies. Yeah. Just uh, or we just use this as a notebook for us to write down all the addresses. Everything here. Yeah. Okay. So, how do we how do we approach this? Um, let's first have a template. Uh, we will just use the template by generated by the Rob Rob gadget. Then let's call it exploit, mm, open read dot Python. Okay, so this is uh, going to, uh, yeah, let me, let me open it here. We need to switch back and forth between many things today, so uh, we just use the um, uh, editor to do that. Yes. 
So this is a gadget we have to give us the shell, and we don't need this. Uh, this is a part we need. We need the 12 bytes of padding. Uh, and this here, it makes system calls. We don't need to make system calls. We just uh, uh, delete all of this, We're not making system calls. Uh, we are going to find things here. Let's see. Did I draw anything here? This is um Okay, so what is the basic idea here? The basic idea is to find the gadget at return to deep state, right? To find the gadget in deep state. We can first do a Python drop gadget, drop gadget. So this is the one that uh, show us This is a tool that give us all the uh, gadgets. And you can see binary. So this is a one. So, okay. so you can see that there are only 67 gadgets available here and uh, uh, probably not many useful ones. For example, at least the way we want something like pop RSI, pop uh, RDI, and obviously there is R pop RDI here, or there is actually pop RSI. Uh, um, there is another pop 15, but this doesn't matter. So we can just uh, skip that by adding another another but probably this is not enough for us to build the chain instead we are going to use the state library so we first do a ldb then return 64 then from this you can say this one is linked into dynamic linked into this c library and this is a c library we're going to use and um, uh, this is actually the loader. Uh, then we will use this gadget to generate the state library. And also you notice that there is a there is an offset uh, of this. This is an offset where this is going to be loaded uh, for other. So let me let me run this multiple times to see if I disabled. Oh yeah, I disabled the. Oh, I did that. So those are different addresses. Okay. So I need to disable ASSR first because I reboot my system. So you know, disable it. Let's disable it first. Let me find that command. We're going to use this command to disable ASR. Now ASR is disabled. Let's try to reload this multiple times. You can see uh, the address is fixed. So this library will be loaded at this fixed address in the active 4 Then 
now we can get, generate all the gadgets. So we're using the same tool. The binary we're giving the C library function. And also we can set an offset here. Uh, so this, this uh, tool uh, give us this, uh, has a feature to, we can set the offset. We can just, uh, we can just do this one. Then it will give all, uh, us all those gadgets and also with the correct address of those gadgets when we run this program, okay? So we have uh, many gadgets here. We're going to we have 10,000, 100,000 gadgets here. Should be enough for us to do all kinds of things. Uh, then we are, let's say we can, uh, what we're going to build. Any ideas, guys, any ideas? What do you want to do with it? Someone, do you have any idea what you want to do? If you are doing this one. No? Not yet. Not yet? Okay. Not yet. So we are going to we are going to call those two functions, right? One is open, one is send file. So we at least we need to know the address of those two functions, right? So we can start print uh, send file. So no, so we find out the send file address is this. Okay, we, we, we just, uh, uh, maybe just to put it here first. Uh, send the file, the say function send file. In this case, it's send file 64, doesn't really matter. It's at this address. Uh, the other one is open. Right? So I'm going to find open. Open is at this address. So we find also open 64. Doesn't really matter. Okay. Then what we're going to do is um, um, well, we know that the file we're going to read is. Um, Secret, uh, and uh, it's a very convenient. It's just a, it's a eight byte. Secret is eight byte, so very convenient. And we also know uh, we need to use the same technique. We need to put this into the dot data section. So we we'll also need to find out where is the dot data section. So we can do a I I means information. Then we can do a file file files. So we can get uh, all everything, all the segments. Uh, in memory, their location, and uh, we can find the data section is at here. So the data section is actually very small here. It's only uh, 16 bytes, but uh, we're we are only going to use 8 bytes anyway, so it doesn't really matter. And after that, there is also a small BSS section we can also overwrite, so it doesn't really matter. So this is the address we are going to use. So this is the address we're going to use for the for data section. Then dot data is this address. Okay. Then let's do this step by step. The first step is to make this system call, make this function call. Um, we need to set RDI as uh, the address of this. So we need to put this somewhere and uh, set the address, then this one set of zero. So it's not like, it's not that part, right? So let's say, uh, if we have RSI, we pop RSI, let's see what, if we can reuse this one. We pop RSI, so the data, so if we put the data address there, then the data address will be put into RSI, then we're going to pop our AX. Then we, our AX, move this one. So, okay, so this doesn't work because if we do this, we were, 
we will put this string's address into RSI instead of RDI, right? Not RSI. So let's say if we can change this one to, let's say we want to find a gadget like this. If we find a gadget like this, it will work. We pop the address into RDI, then move that string to that address. The RDI is not changed. Then we can find it. Then we can. Then after this, we need to do RSI. Oh, there is a do RSI here. By, by the way, let me let me remove this because they are not valid address at this moment. Let's try to find the uh, and then we need to set RSI as zero. So this one we're not going to do this. Let's just need the zero here. So we put zero here. So after this, we can um, return to open, right? So we can do open 64, then this. Okay. Uh, we, will do, we will fix this part first, then we'll work on the second part. So those values don't really matter. Okay. Let's see. Now, if we do pop RDI um, return, so we get this address, we pop RAX, we move RX to RDI. So RX don't really matter, right? We can do RCX, RDX, whatever. Um, okay, this one is correct. So let's see if we can find a gadget like this. Pop RDI. Um, so just to try to find a gadget like this, uh, just to grab. RDI return. Okay, we we did a final gadget. Pop RDI return. We just uh, copy this address here. So this is a valid address. Now we're going to find a pop RAX return. Let's see if we can find one. Okay, there is another one, pop RAX return. So, so far, looks very easy. The next one is uh, move RDX to R, uh, for RX to RDX. Let's see if we can find a gadget like this. Uh, by the way, what you put inside of this is, uh, uh, is uh, uh, regular expression, so you need to those two. Let's see how many can we can move to RDI. Okay, we find, let's see, we find many of those gadgets, but we don't find one. Is there, is there one like uh, RAX? Nope, sorry. Sorry, syntax error. So the syntax should be uh, the syntax should be this. And the perfect gadget would look like this. Okay. This is a, this would be a perfect gadget if we can find one. Okay. We, however, we don't have a gadget like this. Then let's say if we can have a gadget like this. Okay. There are several of those. Mm, let's see if we want to use them. Okay. So those can be used for jump free oriented program, but very difficult to use. Okay, this one looks like maybe usable. So no, yeah, this we are going to read the memory. So it may trigger a segment fault. So we'll be careful with that. Uh, oh, this one looks good. This one we're going to move RAX to EDI, then move R9 to RAX. So this will not change the stack. Then we return. So the value of RAX doesn't really matter to us, right? Do we? Is it? No, doesn't really matter. After this one, we don't care. So we can use this gadget or either this one. So doesn't really matter. So either of these two should be good enough. We're going to use the first one. So uh, there will be a move R9 to RX, but it's kind of not to us. We don't care. So after this, we get the. 
now we have a, so you see here, we're not exactly looking for an exact gadget like this, something equivalent to what we want would be okay. Then we are looking for a pop RSI. Pop RSI, oops, I go this. Okay, so there are so many pop up. Hi, Jeremy, I'm having a class. Okay. okay, so we cannot find the exact gadget we're looking for, like pop return. We don't, we don't have this one. However, you can see there are other gadgets available. For example, this one. There is a pop RSI, pop R15 return. So we can use this gadget. The only, the only problem is there will be a lot of pop. So we need to put some garbage on the stack. So it can be popped into R15. Then where address will be uh, used by return. Does that make sense to you, right? Okay. So if we use this gadget, uh, we use this gadget here. So the gadget we're having is pop RSI, pop R15. Um, I think okay. we have the pop RSI return, the gadget. Sure. Yeah, we'll find one. Oh, oh, here? RSI, right? We're doing RSI. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. There is a gadget. Oh, you're right. Here is a gadget. Yeah. But, the, you know, either way is fine. Okay, so this one will be easier. So we are, so we find this gadget. Then after this, zero will be popped into RSI. Then we were to open 64, uh, which is supposed to uh, give us uh, open the file, right? So let's try to do this. Exploit, open, read, to exploit. Okay. Then we just box this. Um, disassemble, reboot. Uh, we're going to set a breakpoint at the end of it, which is full full. Eight. Then we are going to run this. So now we are at the end of UFU. So we already overflow the stack. Um, we are going to use SI to step one instruction in this case. Now we are going to return. So if we examine the stack, uh, let's examine 10 of those at RSP. Uh, we're supposed to find uh, those values. Okay, the first one will be the gadget's address. The second one will be the uh, address of data section. Let's see if that's correct. Okay, that is correct. This is the gadget. This is a data, another gadget, another, uh, and this one is a dot secret. Okay. Then we do RSI, uh, do SI step instruction. Then we're going to return. Then now we return to our first gadget, which is pop RDI. Then we would pop RDI, then we return again, then we pop R AX, then we return again, then we're going to move RAX to where RDI is. Uh, then we move R9 to RAX. So this is basically for us, this is a not, not doing anything. So R9 is this value, RAX is this value, but RX already put on the Data section, so we can we can check if we already put um, the address there. What's the address? Yeah, that's the address. Yeah, we already put this string at that memory address. So right now we have two strings on the stack, the secret string. Um, uh, the reason we want to do this is because uh, instead of uh, finding a string in this binary, is because obviously this binary doesn't have the string. Uh, if we do the system being SH, being SH uh, it works because there is a string there, uh, what we did last time. However, there are strings we want to put uh, on the, in the memory and uh, those strings are not there. So we have to use this technique. 
Now we do SI again. We return. Uh, we pop RSI to set the second argument, which is zero. Now we return. Now we are in open 64. Okay. So now let's see if we can do finish. And no, we cannot do finish. Um, no, no, let's just do a night here. So we are going to. So it looks like we returned from, we returned from open 64. So you can see the RAX value is, uh, that's our return value is four. That's a uh, fire descriptor number four. And now we get a segment for it. But the reason we get segment for it is we are executing code from this address. And uh, um, that's what we put here because we haven't worked on this part. Okay. And this address for last week's homework, this is a valid address for this instruction. But um, now uh, we're working on different batteries. So this address is not a valid one anymore. Okay. Now let's say what we want to do next. Uh, we already opened the file and we know the file descriptor is four. Um, instead of uh, instead of moving RAX to RSI, we just use four. Then we need to set RDI, RDX, RCX. Looks looks like it's very simple from here. Let's see. Um, well, the first thing is we want to, let's see, RSI, we want number four. So that's easy uh, because we already set it once, right? So here we're setting RSI. We copy this one. Uh, we get, I guess we don't need any of those, just remove this. So RSI, we're just setting the four. The RSI we have uh, four. The RDI we have we want one, and that's also easy. So this uh, we have the standard RDI. RDI we just find one here. Okay. Then after that, what are we getting? We do RDX. Let's check if we can find a pop RDX here. Okay, we couldn't find a pop RDX. So return F, this one will change the stamp, I believe. So it's not what we want. Uh, what we want is a change RDX to zero. Let's say what else we can find. Uh, oh, RDX is zero anyway. Okay, so probably we don't need to do that. But let's see. So we can find the uh, XOR, RDX, RDX. RDX. Okay, there are some, let's say, if anything we can utilize here. Dr. Joe, you said ideally we're going to want pop RDX return if we can find it? Yes. Okay. I, I seem to have it. I, I, I'm almost surprised that your results were so. Oh, you, you find it? Maybe try one more time just with pop RDX. I, I had okay. several. Oh, maybe I was looking for, oh, I was looking for, oh yeah, I was looking for pop RDX and return directly. Uh, there are others, yeah, like a pop RDX, pop 12. This is I good. See. Yeah, this is good. So we can use this one, All right? So what we're going to do is we can, um, we can do a, we can do this one, pop RDX, pop 12. 
R12. Then RDX, we needed a value zero, right? Or we, we need a value zero there. So this one will pop this zero to RDX. Then there's a lot of pop. So we just do a lot of zero or one, that doesn't really matter. The value of R12, we don't care, right? So this will work. So after this, R12 will be one, RDX will be zero. So we only need to set the last one, which is RCX. Uh, yeah, we can just search RCX instead of searching RCX return. So this will give us more gadgets to use. Oh, there is one. We don't need to make any changes. Okay. Then, yeah. You didn't set the address correctly, pop RDX one. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you're right. I forgot to say that. So this one we're going to do here. This is a address for this is an address for pop RCX return. So we need an address for RTX there. This one. This address. Okay. So after this, we already set everything. So we only need to the send file. So we can go to send file. Then we do send file. So the leading zero doesn't really matter, but uh, just to make things look better. Okay. So after this, we are. This is if uh, we didn't make any mistake here, we should be able to generate. We should be able to have the uh, raw share code to read the file and to give us the content. However, there will be errors afterwards, right? Because uh, after this send file, we're going to return uh, to find the next uh, address on the stack to return to. And we didn't set anything here and uh, uh, eventually that will trigger segment four. But uh, let's try this first. We have this. Uh, uh, for the pop RCX, we missed a zero uh, after that line. Which one? Pop RCX return. Oh, 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 oh. yeah, you're right, you're right. But we are when we do, we do not want zero here. Uh, oh. This is a this oh, is a, the number of bytes we want to read. So uh, let's make it like a, uh, anything like fifty. We don't need one thousand. Let's read fifty bytes. Uh, this is fifteen hex. Well, actually, eighty bytes here. We're reading eighty bytes. Uh, yeah. Okay. So if we do this, the program eventually will crash. But here it's supposed to give us the secret. Uh, let's debug this to see if it works. We just try to, oh, uh, somehow we already jumped to send the file uh, because I did an and there is source code there. So for some functions, there is source code. That's why when I do an, uh, I was not doing an I, I was jumping to the, uh, that is a C level doing, let, let's redo this, doing, doing an I there. So here we do SI, S means step, N means next. After we go into the open function, we will change to an I. I hope that, so this will make sure that we do not skip any instruction because, because there is a C code available. Uh, so when I do N, it will 
it will not be very fine going at the disassembly level, the instruction level, instead of at the say statement level. So I want to do NI. Uh, when there is no source code available, then NI basically is the same as N because there's no say level symbol information. Uh, so say, now we are making a system call. This is open. Uh, making system call to open the file. And after that, the file descriptor is forward. Then we compare if that's a valid value, then we go back. Then we return. Okay, now we change to SI, because now we're going to our uh, Rob chain. So now we set RSI again. This time we set RSI as uh, four. Then return, we set our DI, then we set uh, that's a pop. We said RDX, the two pops. The second pop is a kind of lock for us. Uh, then we do a return. Then we do pop RCX. In this case, RCX will be 50 in hex, right? 50 in hex. Yeah. Okay. Now we return to the send file. Then we just uh, keep running. After the, uh, after the system call, we already so did it print out? Did it print out of the sequence somewhere? It's supposed to. I do not see it here. Okay, just continue. Mm, it may already print out it somewhere. Okay, looks like it's correct. Uh, but just let's just run this. See if it works. Okay, it works. It print out how to work, then get a second and fourth. So next, let's just fix the second report, which is easy, right? We just do what what we need to do here. We do a we do a exit. Nah, exit. Uh, so we just need the status zero. That's fine. Then okay, again, return, then start, we print, exit, and we can find the address of exit. So this is the address we want. And uh, we just want to set our di as zero. Then we can gracefully exit. So exit. Then we just need the RD. The first uh, is RTI. Yeah, so this is RTI. Then we set RTI as zero. Okay. So, so with this zero code, we are supposed to just exit uh, gracefully. Okay, so this is how we build the uh, uh, this checker. Okay, uh, next let's try something a little bit more challenging to make this one a little bit more challenging. Uh, here we direct the put four here, right? We direct the put four. Where is four? Uh, oh, here is four. We directly put four there as the file descriptor. Let's say instead of putting four there, can we put, uh, let's remove this two. Let's remove this two. Okay. Somehow we want to move RDI, RSI, RSI. R A X. Okay, this is what we want to do. It may it may take multiple steps to do so, but let's see if we can cleverly do this. Okay. What do you guys want to search? Probably just any of the move R S I's for now should be okay. okay. Yeah. Or 
going to be anything related to R. R. Oh, you want to do RSI, okay. Uh, but the value right now is in RAX, right? So I want to think, is there anything that we can uh, move the return value from RAX to anywhere? Oh, I had it backwards. So, so yeah. move, move RAX, I guess. Yeah, let's Might say, there, how many are there? Is that like a lot? Um, let's see, how many are there for count nine? Ooh, there are 30 solid gadgets with RAX. Is it, so that, if we found a move RAX to RSI, that's ideal, is that right? Yes. Okay, I have, I have one in mind. Oh, really? There is one? Okay. okay. Oh, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm backwards again. Um, I, have, I have RAX comma RSI. I don't know if that's... R... Uh, like this? So you have one like this? I do have one of those. Oh, that one is move from RSI to RAX. Oh, right, right. I yes. yeah, I my syntax backwards. Yeah, so it's so it doesn't work. So let's see if we can find something like this. Oh, there are a lot of other tricks we can use, right? For example. Uh, that's too, um, yeah, that's too hard. I'm thinking we can calculate how many are, uh, what is the value of Rx, and we can increase RSI. Um, yeah, but that's probably too difficult. Let's say there are move RS, Rx to RSI, but they are jump oriented. Uh, I don't know how to do that at the moment. So this one is core oriented. Ooh, that's even harder to use. Mm. So basically we're still doing, you can, you can see that this tool give us other gadgets as well. So gadgets under with jump or gadgets with call, right? So there, uh, that's because after the return oriented programming, people find out that they can also do jump oriented programming or call oriented programming. Okay, that's, uh, uh, but uh, it's, they are much harder to pull off. Uh, oh, oh, there is one. There is one. Ooh, but this one, I think this this instruction will be a problem because RSI has a small value. RDI, hey, that really matter. Let's see what's going on here. We can we can make this as a not actually. So so this one is going to repeatedly move data from RSI uh, as a memory location to RDI as a memory location. So if we put a valid address in RSI and valid address in RDI, this will not trigger uh, a second and fourth. And the number they are going to move is uh, RCX, or uh, ECX. So if we move ECX zero, this may not be a problem. So if we move, if we change ECX as zero, so this one may not work, may not actually, because this is a shift. This is going to shift to right. Shift to right, it's like dividing. So it's already zero, then shift to right is also zero. Then this one will not be executed, right? I, I guess that's it. So, so this gadget may, we may be able to use it. Let's try. Okay, let's try this one. Mm. The gadget we have is this. So, this gadget is. Okay. So if we move RCX as zero, okay, let's try to, so we already have RCX. So ECX is part of RCX, so that matters. So we move, put RCX as zero. Okay. After RCX as zero, I assume this one will not really move anything. So this one will be skipped, so we will not do it. Okay. Then, Let's just try. I don't, I don't really know if it works. Let's do 
buffers. I can set a breakpoint here, obviously. I'm just, uh, I'm just lazy here. So here, we're going to return. Let's use SI. We're going to return to our gadget. So pop RCX to zero. So it's actually already zero, but we did it anyway. Pop RCX zero. So now, we're going to our gadget, move our AX to RSI, our AX to RSI. So our RSI is four. Then we are going to, I think there's a shift right. So ECX will not really change. Let's see if this is that the case. So ECX is still zero. So we're not supposed to do this instruction, I think. So we should not have any segment faults. Okay, good. Because, because this instruction is a repeat instruction uh, and uh, ECX, RCX, or CX in general is a counter in x86. C stands for counter, right? Uh, so uh, it basically says how many times we should do this repeat. And the value here is zero. So we're not going to do this repeat. So we're not going to move anything. So. So even though RSI at this point is four, our DI at this point is a, a big value. We're not going to move things. We're not going to read the memory location. So it's, it will not generate as any segment fault. Um, let's say if we do not have this repeat, we only have an instruction to do this, then we can still make this work. We just uh, set RSI as the data section address. Our DI also has a data section address. So we are moving from a readable to location to a readable location. So it will not generate any fault. But after that, we need to reset RSI and RDI to the value we want, right? So looks like this one works. Now we go here. Now we return. Go to this. Go to this. Oh, yeah, it works. Okay. Oh, it's much easier than I thought. I thought we cannot find a gadget like that. Okay. We actually find one. Very simple. Very simple. Okay. So let's let's go count how many are there with the move of RSI RAX. Oh, there are like uh, 50 gadgets with this instruction there. But most of them are jump oriented. Um, I'm not sure how it works with jump oriented. Uh, I never read the book. I've read the paper actually. Uh, but when I look at this, I think this this may this may trigger a lot of issues, right? If you jump there, what do you do there? Hmm, I'm not sure. Okay, so we're lucky. We find uh, this gadget can can be used. Is there any other gadget here? Uh, return oriented we can use? Not really. Not really, that's the only one. That's the only one return oriented and uh, we can make it work. Okay, so if we do this before right now, but it works, okay. So that's basically um, how we develop this share code. Uh, as you can say in uh, return oriented programming, when you develop share codes, sometimes you need to be uh, quite creative. Uh, you may say instructions you have uh, uh, never seen and you, you think about how I can uh, utilize it uh, to make something uh, crazy. Uh, for example, like the stack pivot one, uh, this, is a, this is actually very, very interesting. Uh, to in, if you in some constraints with some constraints you cannot put a share code and uh, 
you pull out something like this. Uh, the, the possibility here is just uh, the number of possibilities just unlimited. There are so many ways you can you can do this. Okay. Okay. So uh, as a homework, uh, you need to, to do something like this by yourself. Uh, and uh, obviously here you cannot do system calls. Uh, you have to do function calls, except the, the last one. The last one, the exit, you can actually do, here we're doing function calls, uh, but this one we can also do system calls. Yeah, uh, yeah may, maybe let's spend some time to change this one to system calls instead of uh, function calls. Uh, we have the share code generated uh, on last class, right, by the gadget. And you can see, this one was using, this one is doing system calls, okay? So let's do system calls. Oh, we can just copy this one. To do system calls, we just copy this one. Oh, I don't want to copy this one because uh, if I copy this, I have to change all the address. Mm. What we need is we want to find uh, this gadget first. So we need to XOR, uh, AX, RAX. Okay, there is a gadget like this. Let's copy the whole thing, let's copy the whole thing. So we are not going to make the function call here. Instead, we're making the system call. When we set up the RAX, then we need to find the add RAX one and RAX. Mm, do we have that gadget? Oh, we have this one. Okay, let's see. There is a RX one we can use, or maybe. So the reason we're doing this is because I guess because we cannot find a pop RX. Right? If we can find a pop RX, we don't need this add gadget. Let's see. Let's see. Okay, there are some with pop RX. Oh, there's a. Huh, there is a pop RX. So why do we need to that? Is that because the static version of this doesn't have this? Uh, let's try the static version we used last week. No, where is it? Return 64 static. Oh, it has this gadget. Then why we're, that's weird. So the raw chain we generated was using, was using this one, was using add one and one instead of directly using this gadget. We can't directly use that. Let's see. So we have a pop RAX. Just to use it, so we don't need this one anymore. We just do. I think that's because that uh, tool chain, the uh, the the chain generator is hard coded. It's it's only looking for um, the gadget, the end, because he. Probably the tool believes it's a higher chance to find a gadget like that. It's not confident to find a gadget like a pop RAX, but uh, we do find one here. So we can directly use it. Okay. So what is uh, 
what is a system call value for exit? System call 64. Four bit exit would be sixty or three four three C. Is that three C? Three C. Okay. So we can directly use six. We see. Okay. Um, technically, we still need to set uh, up our DI, but the value of our DI in this case doesn't really matter, right? Um, because that's the uh, that's, uh, status value you want to give the share or any or someone else, but uh, don't really care about that. We don't care about that. Um, so we have uh, this gadget, we have this, then we just need to find a system call. And uh, we're doing syscall. And if saved, we should uh, easily find the syscall. Uh, we just need to jump into syscall. So, so this one doesn't, for example, for any of those should work for us actually. Uh, but uh, so we need to calculate the real address for syscall in this case. So now we have a syscall. So this should work as well. Oh, we have a uh, Cisco. Okay, is that correct? So we send file, then we pop 60 to our AX, then we go to Cisco. Okay, looks correct. Oh, I didn't realize that there is a pop RAX. We don't have to go through that uh, um, add there. Uh, but the tool was generating that. So there's no gadget like that. So now we do this and just uh, run this. If it doesn't crash, it means it's working. Okay, it's working. It didn't crash. Cool. Uh, yeah. Back again to verify that. Mm -hmm. Volvo eight Keep running this inside. So now we're in open, we just uh, go in to get out. So now we're in sending file. We'll do an I here. Now we return from send file. Now we'll pop RAX, which is uh, the system call number for exit. Then now we have a uh, 3C here in RX. Then we make the system call. After this, the program just uh, exit with uh, code zero because our DI is zero. We didn't borrow to change our DI. Yeah, so it works. Oh, interesting. Oh, did, I, did any of you realize that uh, there is a gadget called for pop RAX? We don't have to do that. And same one by one there. Even for that static version, which we generated the uh, blockchain, it has a gadget for that. There was a gadget. Uh, so the tool was the tool was hard coded. The tool was not very smart to find the best gadget to use. It's looking for the gadget uh, hard coded ones. Uh, the developer knows maybe the chance to have those gadgets is high, and uh, and just to try to create the same thing. Oh, interesting. I didn't know that. Good. Any questions so far? Actually, uh, Dr. Zhao, I'm, uh, I'm yeah. short one instruction that's ideal, and I was kind of curious to see if mm -hmm. um, it's a game break. Well, not not necessarily a game breaker, but I'm gonna it, that I'm gonna have to change my strategy over it. Mm -hmm. okay. um, 
So it's it's originally when we move that that keyword pointer. Um, keyword. The Which key. One? Yeah. So it's it's pretty early. It's like instruction number five. It's just after we drop the the secret string. Okay. So I don't have a clean one of these. The next the best the next best thing I could find was um, move RDI over RAX, and I think that means I need to um, I need to fix RAX before I can go forward. Does that sound right? Um. But why do we need RAX? Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. It's because RAX is point. Let's see. That, uh, let's see. That, oh. uh, RAX is going to hold the secret string, right? But you don't have to use RAX here. You can technically, you can use. So the key here is to move the address of the string. No, move that string to where RDI points to, right? So the key here is RDI. Right. It's not really RAX. So if you have any other registers you can use, uh, they also work. For example, okay. if we change this to RB, uh, RBX, RCX, and you can find gadgets to do that, it also works. That makes sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, also, if you cannot find a, uh, some instruction like, for example, move things to RDI, or move things to where RDI points to, um, you can also you may find other instruction to move to uh, to another register points to. Then you set that register as the same value as RDI. It's value. So both right. of them points to the dot data section. Yeah, that also works. Yeah. So this is just the unlimited uh, number of uh, possibilities here with uh, sure. with Rob. Yeah. Okay. Now let's move to. Mm. Okay, so in 2014, uh, there was a very interesting paper at IEEE Security and Privacy, and uh, it's called uh, Hanking Blind. Uh, that's basically the title, you can see, Hanking Blind. And uh, uh, you see the last author here, Dan Bowen. Uh, I, I don't really know how to pronounce his name. Dan Bowen, maybe? So uh, uh, he's a big guy in security in crypto. I mentioned him last time we talked about Rob. So basically the professor who uh, invented Rob uh, was also a uh, dance student uh, from Stanford. And uh, Dan made the huge contributions to you know, system security, crypto. Uh, one of the very uh, interesting crypto idea is called uh, identity-based uh, encryption. Uh, that was proposed. That was proposed a long time ago. In crypto, it's like people propose all kinds of crazy ideas. Like uh, uh, they think, oh, this would be very, very useful, but no one knows how to do it. And uh, identity-based uh, encryption is kind of a public key encryption system. So right now, the public key encryption system we're using is like, uh, for example, you use RSA, uh, and uh, you use RSA. When you use it, you need to generate a key pair. You generate a public key. You generate your private key. And uh, the public key part, you can give to anyone. Uh, even other people have your public key. There, There's no way they can generate your private key. Uh, that's why it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a property of the algorithm, right? Um, the problem with this is you have to protect your public key uh, because your public key is also random. Um, if you give your public key to someone else, how can you prove that you own this public key? That's a problem. That's why we have this PKI system. We sign that public key by a buzzer trusted third party, and we call the signed thing a certificate. Uh, that's how the browsers, everything works nowadays. Uh, if you your browser visits google.com, uh, google.com gave your browser its certificate. Basically, it's its public key signed by a third party. And your browser will verify that uh, uh, eventually say, oh, this is the public key does belong to uh, Google. Then we use that public key to build a secure connection between your browser and the website. Um, so this is actually a huge problem because the involvement of a third party. Uh, so the idea of identity-based encryption uh, is the public key uh, is not randomly generated. The, pub, the public key is your identity. For example, your email address. 
then the mathematical challenge here is we have arbitrary but known public key, which could be your email address, could be your name. Then how can you generate a secure, the private key part of this corresponds to your public key and only you can generate that. No one else can generate. It's a, it's a very hard problem. Uh, so uh, Dan Bone was the first one to uh, design a, a practical system to do that. Uh, I think it was back in the 1990s, I think. Yeah, probably. Uh, so um, then what is the other topics in crypto, like uh, homographic encryption, that's also a uh, very hot topics, a very hot problems. And uh, uh, I think uh, the guy who proposed that practical system was also his student. So basically he's a, uh, he's a big guy. Then this paper was pub was the first author was one of uh, his, uh, I don't know a, when, when he published the paper, he was a master student or PhD student. Um, he was at Stanford, but after he published his paper several years later, he was, uh, so this guy AB, so uh, uh, he was in a motorcycle car accident. Uh, so he, he passed away basically. Uh, so, but uh, uh, this work is, um, it's very, very influential. It's called uh, Blind Drop. Uh, so, so far, all the attacks we have been doing, uh, we are using reverse engineering, right? We are, we try to understand what's going on with the binary. We, uh, even though we, sometimes we do not need the source code, but we, most of cases we use binary. Uh, the idea is to, the idea is to understand what the program is doing, uh, what is the accurate offset, uh, everything. Uh, so what they proposed in this paper is totally different. Uh, they do not assume they have any binary of the uh, victim program. They just blindly uh, probe, sending out byte by byte to that victim program. And uh, eventually they can generate a remote rob chain to get a share from that program. And the only requirement for the attack, there are only two requirements for the attack. Uh, first one, uh, the victim program will crash if they generate, uh, after the program crash, the program will restart and uh, the address space may all random, will not be re randomized. Uh, so this is, a, this is a similar to uh, the stack cookie one we did before. We have a server process, we have a worker process, and the server process will create a new worker process if the worker process uh, crashes. Uh, and uh, it, they use fork, we use fork. So the stack cookies will not be regenerated and also address space will not be re-randomized. That's uh, one of the requirement. The second requirement is uh, they can overwrite the stack. That's it. Uh, but overwriting the stack here uh, doesn't uh, also include that uh, maybe there are stack cookies uh, because they are going to guess stack cookies. So the way to guess stack cookies, uh, you guys already developed a program to do that. So that part is not hard. To bypass the stack cookies is not really difficult. So uh, what they are doing is um, give you a program that if it crashes, it will restart itself. Uh, their uh, attacking program will send remotely byte to byte to it uh, and eventually build a ROB gadget to, to perform a right system call. And that right system call can do a lot of things, can, uh, can read the whole program's memory space byte by byte, read those and write it back to the socket. So the remote party can, uh, so it's like dumping the 
So it's like using the Rob gadgets in that binary to generate a Rob chain to dump the program remotely to the attacker. So basically the attacker can get the binary and uh, then can study the battery and do whatever uh, they want to do, find other vulnerabilities. Um, but the first step, the first step is totally blind. Um, so they actually, so like they said in the abstract, uh, they developed uh, this system and uh, under 4,000 requests, they were able to, in 2014, they were able to uh, they were able to compromise uh, Nginx web server uh, with those kind of settings uh, within 4,000 requests. Basically in 20 minutes, fully automatically, uh, they can crack any program like this uh, blindly. So it's, uh, it's just uh, uh, amazing how they did it. Uh, so I never tried it myself, but uh, it's just a, a really amazing, so I want to show you guys. Okay, now we will discuss a little bit about what kind of uh, uh, defense we can do with uh, return-oriented programming. Uh, the first one is um, at compiler level, we can try to remove uh, useful gadgets. And uh, I believe this paper was published in Azure CCS or XSAC. Uh, they were trying to uh, remove useful gadgets by generating some garbages here and there, by, uh, by generating different code that do not have those useful gadgets. Uh, this is one way to uh, defeat this problem. Uh, another way is at uh, system level, uh, we use some statistics. You'll notice that when we, well, while, the, while the observation uh, as a defender, sometimes we observe how attackers attack and uh, based on the observations, we come up with some defense. And the observation here is we have, we have been debugging this code multiple times. The observation is the raw chain is very small, right? It's like uh, maybe 20 instructions something. It's not many instructions. But in those 20 instructions, 10 of them are actually returned half of those instructions or close to half of those instructions are just the return. So that's not normal. Your, usually your compiler will never generate code like that, right? That's not normal. So if at a CPU level, we just trace all the instruction we are executing, we have a sliding window. Okay, for the last 25 instructions, how many of them are returned? If Let's say there is a threshold. If a uh, ton of them are returned, then we say this is probably a raw attack there. Okay, so this is something can be implemented uh, also at uh, maybe hypervisor level, at uh, uh, a CPU level, just to check how many return instructions we have been executing recently. Okay, but uh, this one is also easy to bypass. Uh, for example, we can um, between, let's say, between two Rob gadgets, we can do something that wastes our time, right? Uh, so this is not really a very reliable approach. Uh, you can see that this, this is our gadget. Uh, there are a lot of returns here. Uh, this is a, 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 everything before this is it's open. Everything from here to here is a, a send file. So if we do this, there will be a lot of return. But what if between each return, we just call a say library function to do something, you know, it's kind of like a huge knob slip for us. For example, we can, or we just do a lot of additions just to waste some CPU cycles. Then this kind of approach will not be able to detect that because there are not so many return instructions uh, in all the trees we just uh, executed. Uh, but this is one of the ideas, okay. So uh, this is another idea. Um, also, uh, Intel actually 
the CPU we are using, oh, I think Windows is probably using something like this. I'm not, I'm not 100% sure. Uh, you, can, you can Google a little bit to see how Windows defeats as well. So maybe something related to this. Uh, and also Intel, uh, they have uh, new instructions for us to defeat uh, return oriented programming. Uh, actually, you have seen that instruction a lot. Uh, jump, let's see. How did Jerry done? Let me just stop any program here. Okay, sorry. No screen. Fix it. Sorry. So you notice that um, you have seen this many times, and uh, previously we just uh, ignore this. The first instruction in all those functions, we can see that. It's a special instruction called end branch 64. That's a special instruction. Just notice that. Okay. So in in Intel uh, CPU, you can enable a hardware feature that whenever you do a control flow transfer, obviously on my computer, on your computer, this is not enabled, uh, or probably. Uh, uh, our CPU is not capable of doing this, but in the future, the CPU will be able to do this. All the control flow, uh, like a call, like a return, if there is a call instruction, the next instruction you have to execute or if uh, is this BR, uh, is in the BR64. If you jump to here, instead of a jump to a call to uh, uh, the BR64, the CPU will just uh, generate a hardware fault. The CPU will not allow you to do that. So this is, is an easy way. So if you just jump, want to jump to anywhere in the code, it won't work because the CPU will force you to jump to somewhere like this. Yeah. So this can also help defeat uh, ROP, but it's not uh, available on all the CPUs, I guess, yet. Uh, and also a lesser, very uh, powerful tool to defeat return-oriented programming is something called uh, uh, control flow integrity, uh, which we will not discuss too much in this class, but I will send you some uh, uh, reading materials for you to read. So uh, the idea of control flow integrity is to somehow construct the control flow graph of a program. Uh, and this, this can be done uh, by some static approach and also by some dynamic approach. Uh, when we construct a, the control flow of a program, uh, then uh, we know what are the valid locations the control flow can jump to or call to. Uh, some of this control flow graph is very simple. For example, if it's a direct call, it's very easy to know what is a valid target uh, and uh, because it's hard coded in that instruction. And if that instruction cannot be changed, for example, the whole code section is the execution only, uh, it cannot be overwrite, then it's secure. Uh, the, the, the hard part is the indirect jump or indirect call, like a jump RAX, call RAX, because the value of Rx uh, is known at a wrong time, calculated at a wrong time. But using some static approaches, we still can know what are the possible uh, valid Rax values for those targets. And uh, before we make the call Rax, we will check if the value of Rx is one of those valid ones. Okay, this is called the forward control flow integrity, uh, or if it's jump, the same thing, call jump, the same thing. This is forward because they're jumping to some place. Then there's another thing is when you return from a function to the previous function, the return value is on the stack, right? So on the stack, you have this code pointer. Uh, then you also need to maintain, so this is like the backward flow. So this is called the backward uh, control flow integrity. And uh, 
uh, backward control fluid integrity, we actually already talked about how to protect it. Uh, we just use some uh, uh, shadow stack approach. Use a shadow stack, uh, we can make sure uh, if you only jump to valid, uh, jump back to a valid location, otherwise, otherwise there will be a uh, crunch. So uh, that's why control flow integrity is always used uh, together with uh, shadow stack or other shadow stack like approaches like uh, safe stack uh, because to, to, to use those to protect the backward flow, uh, not the forward flow. The forward flow, we use other monitors to do that. So uh, after this class, we actually uh, finished uh, all the memory attacks I plan to talk. Uh, next two, three weeks, I plan to talk about the cache type channel attacks instead of all memory attacks. Um, so for the homework, uh, I will give you guys several weeks to read this paper. Uh, it's published uh, in Oakland several years ago, maybe five, six years ago. It's called the uh, Eternal War in Memory. So this is a very good survey paper that uh, summarizes all the attack approaches for memory corruption attacks, uh, and also all the defense approaches available at that time. Uh, we covered most of those uh, attacks, but there are some we didn't cover. Uh, for example, um, uh, integer overflow um, uh, heap, we didn't really cover. Uh, so of course, some of those you can use you can uh, you can override heap use uh, existing approaches like uh, uh, format string vulnerability. Format string vulnerability allow you to override anywhere, right? So, uh, so this is a very good read. Uh, by reading this, I hope uh, after after this semester, uh, we learn so many hacks. And by reading this, I hope you have a, a bigger picture of uh, the memory corruption security. Okay. So from next week, we are moving to a very exciting topic, uh, cache side channel attack. Uh, you probably heard something like a spectral meltdown. Uh, those are uh, vulnerabilities in the microarchitecture level, the Intel, AMD, just Intel, Intel, CPUs, Intel CPUs. And we will uh, see how those um, attack works and uh, how to mitigate uh, those attacks. And uh, 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 I have been working on cache set channel attack uh, using cache set channel attack to defeat some other security features as well. So uh, we are going to, uh, so we well, first we will know how cache works. Then we will say uh, demos do attacks to do cache set channel attack. Okay, uh, so three of you, do you have any questions here today? I'm all set, thanks. Okay, very good. Uh, cool, then uh, see you guys next week. Thanks, Dr. Joe. Okay, bye. <laughs>